Yes, okay. Uh, hello, everybody. I have just clicked on recording and I hope everybody is okay with that. So uh, please uh, be aware that this session is being recorded. So if you don't agree to that, you may have to log out. Otherwise, it's a great pleasure to see you all here and it's a great honor to be, have been asked to introduce uh, Nick Peachy. Uh, I have uh, known Nick Peachy for uh, quite a while now, and he has been a tutor and a mentor to a lot of people, including myself. And um, there's a great uh, write-up in the program about his um, accomplishments, he is, uh, his background and his uh, uh, current interests. He, is, he has worked as a trainer, uh, as a teacher, as a freelance uh, conference uh, teacher trainer and conference speaker and he has a lot of experience of uh, sharing and curating content that he uh, shares with us all. Um, he has worked with various publishers such as uh, Macmillan and Oxford University Press and has uh, designed uh, courses, materials, and uh, and and been uh, awarded with uh, quite um, the highest uh, honor of our profession. It's like the Oscar, twice Oscar nominated and winner of the Elton Awards uh, by the British Council for Innovation in English Language Teaching. Uh, oh, that's I. I am so jealous of your two awards, Nick. But you do so, so richly and truly deserve them. And I don't think there is anyone in this profession that would begrudge you that honor. I think um, Nick is very well uh, respected and, uh, and liked by everyone. Yes, that's, that's true. I can see in the, in the text chat that people agree with me and I'm very, very happy to be presenting you. Uh, more recently, he has gone um, the way of publishing and he's established his own publishing uh, company. It's called uh, Nick Peachy Publications. And uh, I'm hoping you will um, uh, look at some of his materials. He produces lovely materials. I'm putting them in the text chat for people to uh, have a look at. We have used them and shared with the, with our trainees and they absolutely adore them. Um, I, I, I only want a very small percentage for this, Nick. Not, not, nothing much. Okay, so it's not going to cost too much. But truly, uh, it's, it's astonishingly delightful and visually lovely material and I hope you will support this uh, publishing endeavour. And uh, he maintains uh, one or two of the um, uh, staple sites that are the go-to sites that we all go to learn about new tools and new ideas and innovative uh, uses of what is sometimes um, not specifically designed for education, but he tells us how to use it. This is his uh, blog, the Quick Shout uh, blog post, um, which is really a great blog to follow, and I'm going to type it in, in here. And today he's going to talk about a really favorite topic of mine, uh, autonomous teacher development, and he's going to show you all the tools and practices that you need to get started. So over to you, Nick. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, and thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, I, I was sort of looking at some of the people's names as they were arriving and I'm, I was realizing that I actually I might be mentioning a few of you and, and I'm also a little bit worried that I may not have pitched this, this uh, presentation quite high enough and a lot of this might be quite familiar stuff for you. But anyway, you know, do participate and share what you know as well through the chat, you know, I'm fine with that. And um, at various times I'll be uh, trying to encourage you to participate and offer things through there too. Okay, so this uh, session's on tools and practices for autonomous to teacher development. It's, it's strange because it's a, a session I've been doing on and off for about the last 10 more or more even years and 
I used to do it and people used to sort of, I, I, I would finish it and people would look at me kind of as if I was some kind of weirdo. And now it sort of seems to have finally come of age and, and sort of people are, are at, the, at the stage where they're, yeah, yeah, but that, that's kind of what I do kind of thing, which is, is great, I think, which is really good. But anyway, I'll move on with it if I can get my screen to move on. Um, Th these are just uh, some links and some information about me, my various roles. I'm director of PG Publications. Uh, I'm also an online course des designer and won the 2012 Innovations Award for a course that I designed for Bell. Um, also a pedagogical author and a couple of my books have either been shortlisted or won Innovations Awards. And I do work in uh, learning technology consultancy. And along the bottom of the screen there, you can see links to my different social and media accounts and the different things that I share online. Um, at the end of the presentation, I'll give you a link to this presentation and you can uh, go through it and find any of the links or follow up on anything that you're interested in because I will be you know, referring you to a lot of links and, and different things throughout the session. So if, you're, if you don't have to take notes, get the link at the end and you can just, and I do work in learning technology and consultancy. And you can watch everything. Uh, okay. So from the yeah. Yeah, we've got someone who's chatting in the background anyway. Okay, I'll push on to the next slide. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about getting old. I know that's not what you're here to, to, to hear about, but um, it, a funny story, at least for me, um, I, I think it's funny, is a few years back, um, a, a guy contacted me and wanted to interview me um, on Zoom and to record the interview. And, you know, he wanted to ask me about things in, to do with educational technology. So we arranged a time and, um, you know, it, when the time arrived, I connected up to Zoom. I could see this young man looking at me and I could see his face was kind of like, and he was, looking a bit confused and he said, are you Nick Peachy? And, uh, you know, and I said, yeah, I'm Nick Peachy. And it, it was like, you know, he was about to say, is your son also Nick Peachy? Nick Peachy as well. But, um, but the, the, what the point that I'm getting at is he expected someone much younger. And, you know, it seems increasingly that technology and working with technology is something that's linked to younger people. And, uh, and, and I guess that's, I'm trying to sort of segue into why I think this is such an important session because, you know, for me, um, to keep up with the profession that we work in, to keep up with educational technology, I think you have to be constantly developing yourself, you know, and constantly all the time looking for new things, trying to understand what's happening and how that relate within the world and how that relates to, to education and technology. You know, I finished my, I did a master's in educational technology, which I finished almost 16 years ago now, back in 2004. And, you know, most of the things that I studied on that in terms of the technology um, have long been superseded. So, you know, as teachers, we need, do need to keep developing and uh, keep, up with you know what's happening in our world i've got a little quote for you there um, and you've got 30 seconds to complete the quote as you think it should be completed so there are teachers are like sharks you can write into the chat the way you think that that sentence should be completed some of you might already know i'll give you just a few seconds to write that before it appears on the screen I like some of the, yeah, huh? yeah, somebody's got it, yeah. And, uh, you know, teachers are like sharks. When they stop moving forward, they start to die. And I, I really think that's true. It's, it's kind of true about myself, at least, you know, I got to a, a point where, you know, I'd done my CELT, I'd done my diploma, and, um, you know, and, and I really didn't think I was moving forward anymore. And that's when I got really interested in technology. And that's one of the things that keeps me forward. And, and I think, you know, it's very easy to become very stale as a teacher doing the same things if you don't keep moving your profession forward. And, you know, most of my learning, at least since 2004, the last 16 years has been self-directed. And in a way, that's kind of what I want to share with you today. Um, before I share it, I'd like to ask you as well how, what you do to keep your, your teaching moving forward. If you scan this QR code here, 
um, you'll get a link to a Mentimeter with a little with a little quiz in it, which you can uh, fill out, and then we'll see the results together. So what do you? The, it gives you a few options about what to do to keep moving your 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 yourself forward professionally. I'll just grab a link and share it with through the chat as well if you want to fill it in there. There's a chat link there. Back to my presentation. Okay, so if you can start. Hmm. This toolbar doesn't want to move. Okay, got it. Okay, so if you start clicking in there, filling in and sharing there, and we'll have a look at how the results are looking. Okay, there's a few results coming through there. Presentation. So I did this re originally did research on this a few years back to see what kind of things um, teachers did most. I, I'm, I'm assuming that this is going to be ver a very different result, partly because, you know, we have a lot of more experienced teachers in the audience and also because of the times that we're living in. At the time, um, the one that came up as being the, the most popular was going to conferences, which of course is something that we can't do anymore. You know, it's great and somehow predictable to see that we now have, you know, most the most popular one is attending webinars and attending online webinars, which is great. And um, what looks like being second is reading blogs by other teachers, uh, collecting and curating online materials. So that's great. Yeah. All lots of things that that teachers can do on online. I'll just move on a bit. I, I have a, a quote that I always also use in this presentation is that, I, you know, I believe everything we need to keep our teaching moving forward can be found online. I'd just like you to type into the chat whether you agree or disagree. So you can type in true or false. There's an interesting one about, no, we need to connect with real people in real time. And, but in fact, that's what we're doing now. But um, actually, I'll, I'll preface that with, no, I actually, oh, good, sorry, go back. I think there are sort of limitations on that because there are problems, you know, and the problem is this is the, the amount of data that's produced online every every day in just one minute online. There's this huge amount of data constantly being produced. And through this huge amount of data, we have to find the data that's relevant for us and that, that, we, that is useful for us. So I'd like to, like to change that to everything we need to keep our teaching moving forward can be found online somewhere. And that includes real people, that includes face-to-face -face interaction nowadays. I mean, none of us have had, I haven't had much face-to-face -face interaction with anyone from the teaching profession for a couple of months in the physical world, but I'm still getting face-to-face -face interaction of this kind now. And I think, you know, that is still really valuable. So, I think what we need to do if we want to make use of all this data that's around us and all these tools and different things is, is develop our, our information literacy skills. And what I'd like to share with you in this presentation is some of the kinds of things that I do um, to keep my teaching up to date and to keep my knowledge fresh and, and, and uh, to keep it moving forward. And um, so, this is very much a personal view. Uh, it may be very similar to the to the view that you have yourself, um, but and the, the kind of things that you do yourself. But we'll have a look and, and see. So I have this kind of what I call a literacy cycle, which I go through, and I work around this circle. You know, I look at accessing information and finding information, deciding what to ignore, filtering information, evaluating information, 
trying to turn information into knowledge and then reflecting on how I use it and, and, and then maybe sharing it. So for me, this is my kind of information literacy cycle and that goes around and round and things into, interchange and go across as well. And uh, what I want to do is sort of show you how that works for me at least. Uh, one of my key tools is Twitter, which I'm sure it is for many of you. If you're on Twitter, please do share your Twitter through the chat now so that we can sort of find other people to follow um, or, or other people who, who aren't on Twitter can, can find people who are here who are worth following. Um, Twitter is great, but to some extent, it's like having all of these people together in a room all shouting, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, you know. In order for it to be really useful, you have to know how to use it properly. And I think some of the, the key things to using it properly for me is knowing not what to ignore and how to ignore the irrelevant. And of course, there's an awful lot I that is irrelevant. So the keys to, I think, getting most out of Twitter is, is actually understanding how hashtag works, making sure that when you post something, you always include hashtags and doing searches and searching for information based on hashtags. Um, there's a list of hashtags that I find useful here. Um, if you have any other hashtags such to suggest, by all means, do uh, type them into to the chat now. I think particularly hashtags that are related to what, what everyone seems to be struggling with at the moment, which is remote teaching, remote learning, or teaching or learning English online. And by all means, add any hashtags to the chat that you would recommend people, people follow. Okay, great. Good to see some really interesting ones too. The COVID teaching is, is a, an interesting one. So, you know, Twitter is an easy thing to search through, you know, just by doing hashtags and it's worth going and if you're looking for information, just going and searching on a hashtag or following a hashtag. One of the most useful tools I find for, for Twitter is, is TweetDeck, which, you know, has the, the capacity to actually stream um, stream the hashtags and filter things for you. And I, I, I find I'm really dependent on, on, on Twitter for, for streaming information for me. If you go to TweetDeck and you, you open an account and then you can add hashtags at the top. If you look along the top of the image here that I have, you'll see there are hashtags lined up there and that separates all the information into, into different streams for me so that I can find you know the things that are relevant and and the things that I want when I'm when I'm looking for them, which generally tends to be sort of while I'm having coffee in the morning uh, uh, before I start getting serious about work. So I think TweetDeck is a really useful tool for that. The other thing, of course, is knowing the right people to follow. And here I've sort of I've got some suggestions of people to follow. Um, Larry Falazzo, always sharing materials, a huge amount of materials about um, teaching online and ESL. Russell Stannard, you know, great at sharing videos and tutorial videos, especially if for, at the moment, if you're, if you're trying to, you know, if you're looking for, for Zoom tutorials or Edmodo tutorials or things like that, Russell's a great person to, to follow. Shelley, who's been around for a long time, I've, I've added myself rather vainly as, as well. I share quite a lot of stuff, but that's a sort of base, good basic starter kit. You know, if you only sort of share those, if you only follow those 10 people, you know, you'll be off to a good start in terms of, uh, in, in terms of, um, you know, getting some good information. Okay, so Twitter is a lot about who to follow and following the right hashtags. It's all a matter of, you know, quality in, quality out. I mean, the other thing that I'm, I've, I've always found really useful for, for sharing and finding information is, is Facebook groups, um, particularly groups rather than pages because they're open for everyone to co contribute to. And, uh, you know, finding groups related to, to teaching online or, or elements of ELT is, is also, uh, you know, a great source of information. A lot of us go to Facebook anyway, so, you know, it's got a constant 
flow of information turning up there whenever I go. It's very easy to find groups if you go to the Facebook groups page and then do a search you can on ELT, ESL, teaching online, you'll find lots and lots of groups there as well. You know? um, but if you don't want to take the bother of searching the groups out for yourself, here are, here's a few that I, I would recommend and that I think you could give a try. By all means, if you have a group or, you're, or you know of a very good group, you know, please do share it in, with everyone in the chat right now. You know, that's, that would be great. So these are some of my sort of go-to groups for, for language and teaching related resources. But again, um, get the presentation at the end and come back and get the links then. I won't, don't worry about trying to sort of copy down links or names now. So that's Facebook, which I think, you know, is a really useful networking tool. It's great to go and look for information, great to be able to find good information, but it's even better to get information coming to you. And this is what I call the kind of information in stage. And one of the, the key tools that I used for finding information each day is um, Paperly, which is a, a, a digital newspaper. You can very easily create your own newspaper, your own Paperly newspaper. And uh, if you click on the link, you decide what, what what topics you're interested in and uh, or enter what, what things you want information sent to you about as I am now, although I'm not spelling it very well. And then you can set up your, your own newspaper so that paperly scans through the various different um, online resources such as Twitter, blogs that are posted and it, and it and it prepares a kind of a summary of those of about eight different links and it sends them to my email address every morning. So I've got two or three different newspapers set up using Paperly and they send me the information that I want. So when I'm having my coffee in the morning, I can look through the different links, find out what's being new and what's being published about sort of different aspects of technology and uh, and then I can sort of, you know, share those or read them when I have time or save them and curate them. So I find that really very useful. So by all means, it's a good idea, it's free. Create your own paperly newspaper and get information coming to you. And that's what it looks like, although they've, they've modernized the interface a, a little bit. So I get that, that message every morning. I can just scan through the different headlines and images and decide what I want to write. So I find that really useful for sort of keeping up to date and getting something new in every day. And then I can decide how I want to share it. The other thing that I've been using for absolutely years and still find useful is Digo and the group section of Digo. And Digo is a social bookmarking tool so you can, and you can join groups on it. So if you join a group on, on Digo, you find out what other people in your group with a similar interest, they're like special interest groups, and you find out what they're sharing. So that's great because, you know, you're not having to, to filter through something that's been, you know, put together by an algorithm or, or, or dependent on a hashtag. You go and find materials that's being shared by other authorities who are interested in the same thing and so i find that's really useful and again you can set it up so that it delivers you a digest to your email address so um you know what i still get is this email digest once a day or once a week which sends me any new links that have been created from you, the people that share my group um, it's been around for ages still works and still does the job Oh, we've got somebody noisy around, haven't we? Okay, they've gone. Okay, so that's Digo, and that's another great way for, for getting information coming to you. Uh, once you get information, getting information is great, but you know, you plow through this information, what do you do with it? And uh, one of the things, you know, that I think is important is curation and actually curating what you do and, and going through that process of thinking about what you're going to do with it. Is it worth saving, evaluating it, all of those kinds of things. So 
no, before I curate anything, I have my sort of tick list of questions that I asked, ask, and that's, you know, did I learn something new from it? Did it confront my existing beliefs? Sometimes it's good to create, curate even things that you disagree with. Um, will I need to find it and use it again? Can I use it in my teaching or in my research? Would it be a benefit to others if I share it? And the last thing, of course, is where and how do I classify it? So when I'm reading through something that catches my interest or I'm looking through stuff, those are the things that I, that I go through and uh, think about myself. I have a, a few different curation tools that I use. I'm really keen on Scoop It. Again, I've been using it for quite a few years. This is one, this one's my Tools for Learners Scoop It, where I collect different tools um, for the, that I think can be used by teachers or learners in, in education. I'll pass a link to it so you can have a look. So my first sort of line of classification is, you know, is it a tool worth saving and sharing that I might need again? Or, uh, or is it news or research related? So that's where I sa save all of my kind of, uh, all of my tool related stuff on my tools for teachers and learners. And again, you know, I've got to the stage now, I've been doing it for about eight years. I've got about 1500 tools listed on there. I can always go to it and search through them and find what I want again and, uh, and, um, and, Again, it's something that other people can subscribe to. It has about 30, I think it's about 34,000 subscribers that, that follow that, that channel. So, you know, it's a way of, you know, collecting things for myself and also sharing with other people and helping other people benefit, which, you know, if you're going to do it, you might as well help some other people too. You know, in the case of research, I share research or, or more, more sort of theoretical based articles on learning technology news. And again, you know, that's something that I've built up over many years and, and you know, so that I go back to time and time again whenever I want to share to find something related to, to what's going on technology or if I, I need to do some research into some aspect of technology, I go there first and see what I've already saved. So I find that's, you know, that's something that's really useful. And... Uh, so that, that's sort of my primary way of, of organizing resources is those two scoop it sites. So it, either it's tools, you know, that's great. I put them on tools for technology or it's, or it's news or theory related. So that's my sort of background theory reading. So those are my two major, major sections. Yeah, there's lots of other things. Yeah, I used to use Delicious. Is Delicious still hanging about somewhere in some form? I've, tr I've tried Wakelet. The other thing I've just started using more recently is something called Mix. And that, that's kind of, that, that I, it's a bit like something else I was using, which was called Bagit. Um, you can actually cr um, collect you can actually divide things into collections and I've started breaking down my tools so that they go into different collections and uh, I'll just share a link to to that with you and I have different collections there so actually now when I when I find tools I can share them put them into these different collections still share them with everyone and they're kind of divided into tools for, for specific purposes. So if I've got things that I think would you, be useful for developing writing skills, they're in one place. I've got AR related tools and VR related tools in different places, game-based learning tools and, and resources somewhere else. So, you know, having that information come to me and sifting through it, evaluating it, deciding what's you, useful and where to put it. You know, that's my cognitive processing for for really digging a bit deeper into that and being able to use it again at a later date, which I think is very important. You know, it's, it's always really frustrating if you, if you spend a lot of time fi um, uh, finding things and, in, and find something you like, and then when you need it again, you know, it's, it's, and you can't find it, it can be incredibly frustrating. So, you know, having that level of organization in your, it can really help with your professional development and, you know, save you time. So do check those out. Um, 
before I go on to the next section, if we maybe if, if anybody else has different tools that they, they use for curation, it'd be great if you could type them in to, to um, the chat now, especially if you have links to stuff, if, you, if they're curated resources that you share, if you could type them in and, and share them with everybody, that would be great. I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that while I, while I have a quick drink of water. Yeah, great to see um, Pinterest. I like I love Pinterest and and sort of collect videos that that I use for teaching on there. Um, one of the other things that I find really useful actually is is I stopped using Padlet when they started charging and because I hadn't used it for quite a while and you started using something else called Millanote, um, which I find really useful for sort of collecting and taking notes on, on sort of very mixed resources. I, th I find that that's great. I'll see if I can find a link to, you, to that for you now, actually. Mm. I'll share it with you. No, I'm logged out. That's going to have to wait. Yeah, if you check out Miller Note, I'll just share the link. That's another great tool for sort of resourcing. We can sort of mix different types of resources as well and take sort of very good, it's got some very good sort of sharing and note taking um, features as well. Great tool for, uh, for um, digital skills and digital literacies. You can drag images into it, videos, and as well as sort of links to articles and that kind of thing. It's very much like Padlet, but um, I, I kind of prefer the interface as well, which is nice. Okay, the next thing I, I guess that's really important is, you know, it's great to collect all these resources. It's great to, to, to um, have them somewhere so that you can find them. One of the other really important thing is, is that, you know, if you use them and reflect on them, so use them in your, your teaching and then do some reflecting. And, and I guess so for me, the, one of the most important ways of, of reflecting, I think after you've done something with it in your teaching is to write a blog. And I really think that, you know, everybody, you know, especially at the moment, I think everybody should be blogging, you know, especially because, you know, a lot of people are making that move to sort of being, a, to having to teach online, they're learning new things. And I think the best way to learn and develop is to sort of share what you're learning and write about it, reflect on it, and then publish it and get other people's feedback on it. These are a couple of uh, blogging platforms that are really popular. You can use Medium, which is very fashionable at the moment. Um, I use Blogger because I've had been using Blogger for years and years and uh, I've got so much stuff on there it would be difficult to change. I've also got a blog on WordPress. It's easy to cre create a WordPress blog, which is great. And if you want to sort of, if you want to blog on LinkedIn, you know, that's also, you know, something that that can really sort of help to build your professional profile as well. You know, I think one of the, the great things about blogging is when you're writing it and, and, you know, you get to that point at the end of an article that you've written and you have to hit the, the publish button, you really have to start thinking about carefully, carefully about how that represents you and how that represents your beliefs. You know, it's very different from writing a per personal or private journal you know once you share things and you're putting out there you have to be pretty sure that that's what you believe in and you know and that sort of process of reflection I think is very useful and can really you know help help you you kind of develop and think more carefully and here's a, a quote to reinforce that that um, I gra grabbed from something that Scott Rosenberg wrote By all means, if you have a blog or you write a blog, could you share a link to it through the chat? That would be great. It doesn't have to be the platform. It can be the link to your whole blog. You know, it'd be good to see what other people are writing about and you know, find other people who are blogging. There was a huge craze for blogging at one time and then it seems it seemed to have died out a lot um, in more recent years. I wonder how many people 
blogged at one point and have since given up. Uh, if you've given up, why can't you out yourself and just say, I've given up and type that into the chat as well. Yeah, it's quite a discipline to, to keep doing it very regularly. And, uh, you know, and it can be time consuming as well. But I think, you know, if you're going through this sort of this period of rapid change that we're all going through at the moment, it's great to sort of, you know, help process that, to write it down and, uh, and you know, to share it with other people who are, and who are going through similar things and, you know, encountering similar problems and sort of finding different ways to deal with them. Great to see so many people sh sharing their blogs. Yes, Graham, you should start again. Come on, get with the program. Okay, I just move on a bit. If there aren't enough blogs being shared with you through the chat now, you know, there's a um, a great link on on I think feed burner. Is it feed? No, it's not feed burner. Let's find it. Feed. Feedspot and Feedspot shares the, the top 100 um, ESL blogs. I'll share a link to that with you. So if you want to go and have a look. Um, and uh, if you've shared your blog there, you might want to go and look and check that it's on there. But if you're looking for inspiration or to find out who is blogging and stu who's still doing it regularly, you know, by all means, go and have a look there and uh, find out what people are talking about and, and what, what's being blogged about at the moment. You know, I think that's a, you know, reading people's blogs and their thoughts about what they're doing with teaching and training, you know, particularly at the moment, is, is uh, quite interesting. Oh yeah. In terms of bloggers to check out, uh, you know, there's our Russell Stannard, you know, he's a more of a video blogger or a vlogger than a blogger. Does, does that make sense? I hope it did. It sounded really weird in my head, but yeah, but he's producing loads of videos at the moment about different aspects of teaching online, you know, being exhausted, using Zoom, using different platforms, you know, and I think it's definitely, if you're, if you ask or you know people who are struggling or, or you're managing people who are struggling to sort of make the, make the change to teaching online, then, you know, checking out his, his uh, site and his videos can really help you a lot. So, you know, I'd highly recommend, you know, having a, a look at those. I'll grab the link and share it with you through chat if you want to have a look. Uh, I'll grab the link for later. You know, Russell's, you know, been working with technology for for donkey's years, a bit, a bit like I have, and you know his videos are really helpful and and instructive, and especially if you want you know a quick fix and you want, don't want to read about it, you want to see how it's done. So with you know when it comes to sort of dealing with sort of technology aspects of teaching, those are really great and something that you know I'd highly recommend. Another one person who's been teaching about tech and, and blogging about technology for years is Shelley Trail. You know, well worth checking out her, her blog too. It, it's quite regularly updated still and uh, has lots of relevant stuff on it, especially for teaching now. You know, so, you know, by all means go and, and check that out and, uh, and get some inspiration or, or some ideas from there. A couple of newer people that, that, that seem to be blogging and it's good to see that, you know, lots of younger people are blogging. Well, most people are younger than me, but, you know, more, there are more kind of upcoming bloggers with the, and blogging seems to be going through a revival in the, in the younger generation. So that's great. This is one that's, that's a great example. And again, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll share the link to her blog with you. you know, there's lots of very up-to-date stuff that she's doing and uh, interesting stuff. You know, it's good to see a, a lot of teachers who are younger teachers who are getting involved in things like TikTok as well and, and sort of using that and things like TikTok and, and Snapchat um, for networking and for sharing information as well, which is really great. So that's, I, that isn't a typo on the, 
on my slide that is teacher r and uh, so so check out our blog if you want to see something from someone new and fresh and another Another quite new, fresh one is, is Celia Celia Nobre's ELT blog, and and again, you know, she's a a Brazilian who's working in Turkey. You know, check out her blog, have a look, and uh, and see what what other people are doing, and uh, and and how they're coping with the different aspects of sort of teaching online and making that shift and and develop their professional development. Good for you. Good for you, Leo. Okay, so those are those are some blogs to check out, and I really do sort of recommend you know blogging and and sort of using that as a way to reflect and share what you're learning. Is is there anyone who doesn't or who has never blogged? Could you type in no, never, no or never if you've never done it into the chat? Just interested to see. Yeah, that there are a lot of no nevers, and and it always surprises me that that people sort of don't write more about what they do. Um, you know, for me, writing my blog was an incredibly important part of my professional development. You know, I I left the British Council and decided to go freelance in uh, back in two thousand and seven, which was you know thirteen years ago. And at the time, I, I'd been managing the British Council's teaching English website, had quite a high high profile within ELT and as soon as I left you know I really realized that I was sort of just Nick Peachy and I had nothing to represent what I did and so basically I started blogging to sort of build my portfolio and that was you know that's been my step into sort of publishing getting writing work getting consultancy work getting training work you know everything really started from there you know and I and I you know nowadays you know I tend to find that you know if work either comes to me or I don't get it. You know, if I have to send someone a CV, you know, and, and write a job lab application to try and get some work, I never get it. But, you know, because of my blog and because of the social media presence that that's helped me to build up, that's where all my work comes from. And, you know, and, and in a lot of ways for me, that's, that's much better because, you know, I don't have to go out and start writing uh, job at work applications and things like that all the time and, and pitching for work, which is, you know, a bit of a drag. But so, you know, if you haven't ever blogged and you, you think you might have something to say, and really, if you're a teacher, you know, you probably do have something to say about teaching. And I'd highly recommend, you know, you get into it and, and start doing something. Think about what you have a value that can be shared. You know, and I think most of us have something of value if we've been involved in education. I'll move on a bit. So the last thing is sort of planning and sharing and what you do next. And here's a few of my quick tips. You know, if you want to use, you know, and you're going to use the internet for your professional development, you know, make a specific time for it each day. Make it a little bit of you time where you think, this is my time each day where I'm going to, no, that's not my daughter, where I'm going to uh, sit down and sort of get, do, develop myself. You know, whether it's 10 minutes or 15 minutes, you know, just a little bit of time every day. You know, the, the brain is like a muscle, you know, I think you have to exercise it every day. You can't just do it once a year by going to a conference or once a month by, by going to a webinar, you know you have to keep using it every day and keep building it and build, keep building those, the connecting those neurons together. You know, even if it's only 10, 5, 10 or 15 minutes, you know, going to Twitter, picking out something to read or getting that virtual newspaper sent to you and picking out something to read and doing that, you know, that's great, you know, but make a time for it. My time is when I have my coffee in the morning, which is really quite early. And, uh, you know, and that's the time that I develop myself. Be selective about you what you read just because you've got your Twitter feed streaming through lots of things or your 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 virtual newspaper sending you lots of links doesn't mean you have to read them all. Select something that you th you think's got an interesting headline. Dig into it. Don't read all of it. You know if if you find it's not relevant or it's boring or or you know it's not what you thought of it was. Or just look for the important chunks. You know that's something that I often do. 
there are often these these articles you know 10 reasons why you should do x and they they come with a, a very long introduction which starts on why the person's had what the person's had for breakfast i generally skip that bit and go straight to the 10 things scan it and, and make sure that i'm looking in for the ones that are really relevant and important for me so you know scanning stuff is really really useful um the other thing that I do is, you know, probably like most of us, especially now we're all having to work online, is we find ourselves procrastinating quite a lot. You know, I, you know, try and make your procrastination time learning time instead of, you know, going to Facebook and looking for kittens or sharing, you know, uh, looking at people's status updates. Go to the Facebook groups instead. Look for something valuable to read and to sort of give you some food for thought. Um, the other thing is, you know do something with your professional development. You know, if you're reading something, do something with it, share it, curate it, you know, comment on it, try and enjoy it. And I guess the next thing is for me is, you know, to have a plan. You know, if you don't have a plan, you're not likely to get anywhere. So, um, you know, sort of think about, you know, making plans for how you're going to develop yourself. Self. You know, smart plans are great. Those that, that smart acronym make it specific, measurable, authentic, realistic, and time bound. And I think one of the most important things for you know planning your own professional development. And the, here on the screen, you can see some suggestions for things that you'll do. But one of the most important things I think for, for planning your own professional development is making it time bound. You know, commit yourself to a time by which you will do a certain number of things because otherwise it's very easy just to postpone it, delay it, put it off until another time. You know, the internet is always there, so we can always do it another time. But, you know, commit to doing, you know, I'm going to join five Facebook groups, I'm going to write um, one blog post each week, and I'm going to start by, you know, this date. So, you know, Give yourself a deadline and commit to exactly what you're going to do. You know, and that's, uh, the, here's, here are some suggestions for what you can maybe try. So, you know, that's my process. That's my cycle of, of development that I work my way around, uh, go around there into clockwise. The last thing, sharing and reflecting, you know, make sure you do share back, you know, what you do, you know, write that blog, share. If you're, if you're finding useful tools, useful articles, you know, share them, produce, uh, curate them and use a curation share site that can, other people can access. You know, that's, that's, you know, that makes it much more valuable and makes it much more valuable to put your time into as well because it's part of your professional development and can lift your professional profile too. Um, a lot of the things that I've been, been talking about and a lot of the way that I've that I work is connected with connectivism and there's a great um, video here at the end of the, the presentation that you know is an introduction to connectivism so you know I'm not going to play it now because it's about five minutes long but I rec recommend you have a look at it and uh, you know if you're if you're new to connectivism and the connectivist theory then it's well worth looking at. Connectivism was was um, or originated by uh, Stephen Downs and George Siemens, who, who who created what was one of the first original MOOC courses, and and they were based around you know social interaction between people and people using the internet to help each other learn, and they put together this sort of theory of connectivist learning, which is is very much like you know a theory of autonomous learning through the internet so i think that's you know, really well worth checking out and watching and uh, you know it's it, it's sort of for me it was the bedrock on how i started to be, develop myself and keep my own knowledge up to date so so i think that's well worth checking out that's your homework if you like um Thanks for listening. Uh, it's been a bit of a mad rush and um, I've gone a bit too quickly. So I've got, but I wanted to sort of leave some time at the end for questions if there are any. And the QR code that you can see in the middle there is a link to this presentation, which it has sort of all the links and is, is interactive exactly as you've seen here. And I'll send you a link through the chat to the presentation as well. So if you want to sort of rewatch it and go and pull out some of those Go and pull out some of those links or to different tools or different articles or different bloggers, by all means do. But, you know, I've tried to share as many of them as I can. 
if you want to go and check out my uh, different social networking if you look along the bottom of the the, the presentation slide here all of these are linked to my different networks um, you can follow me on twitter if you want more information or you know go to my site by all means feel free to buy my books you know that would be great and um and uh, enjoy your uh, enjoy your developing your 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 uh, professional competence so that's about it for me um, i'm happy to answer any questions or if if you've heard enough by all means leave and um, i'll keep an eye on chat for questions otherwise thanks very much for listening and uh, hope you enjoy going back through the, the presentation I'll just share that link through the chat once more because it's uh, moving quite quickly. How do I curate images of my phone? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Somebody asking about curating images from the phone you can it's very easy to grab i mean i work on apple and it's very easy to grab images from your phone and just um, uh, dump them straight onto the computer to share them um, i'm not sure what that means if anyone wants to clarify that and there's a question about when going back to real schools that's an interesting question about when we'll be able to go back you know i think I don't know when we'll be able to go back, but when we do go back, I don't think the move will be total. And, you know, I think it's going to be a very different kind of school that we go back to. And uh, that's that's the topic of a, a talk that I'll be doing for, um, for, for Vance in, and the Webheads in a couple of weeks time. You know, I think, you know, there are this, there's going to be a lasting change and, and things aren't going to be go back to the way they were. You know, we're looking at the, a new normal and it's going to be quite different and there are lots of things that could impact on that. So if you're interested in that, you know, keep in touch with me and I'll let you know when I'm doing that talk because that, that's something that takes that's going to take a while. Uh, Nick, uh, there is uh, some question here. Do you recommend that people avoid information overload? And well, how do you keep from being overwhelmed? Uh, Joe McVeigh wants to know. Well, I think, you know, you know, the, the sort of knowing how to access your streams of information is what can help you do that. You know, if you've got the right information coming to you, if you're like, for example, I use that, that um, digital newspaper, Paperly, and that just sends me four or five links every day. Or if you just go to Twitter and you have, like I use TweetDeck, you know, there's a lot of information coming through there. You know, you just select what you want to know about. And you have to be selective, you know, don't expect to be on, is it omnipotent or omnipresent? Omni omniscient. Uh, omniscient, that's the one I can never remember. <laughs> don't, don't think that you have to be omniscient and know everything and learn everything, you know. People are often worried about left behind, being left behind. But actually, you know, education moves pretty slowly, really. You know, okay, we've been forced through into a big leap here of everyone suddenly having to teach on Zoom. But, but Zoom's been knocking around for a long time. And so has, you know, teaching using virtual classrooms. So, you know, don't think that you have to be omniscient and uh, know everything just you know take what's useful for you you know don't don't be overwhelmed you know just take what you what's useful for you and just follow the right people people like yourself yeah. people like russell some of the blogs you mentioned yeah following the right people helps following hashtags helps rather than you know trying to dive into everything you know 
I found going to Google to look for things seems to be increasingly useless these days. You know, there's so much of what you find is just, you know, is marketing uh, uh, information that was produced for marketing or clickbait and things like that and or something that's Google's being paid to promote you know I think it's really about knowing the right people to follow and the right places to follow and, and following the right streams of information. Do you have any advice for people wondering about how to improve their English being non-native uh, teachers? Does uh, the, your autonomous uh, development contain any advice about how to improve your language skills as a teacher? It's always, oh, it's always a question. There's masses of stuff out there. You know, Netflix, if you don't have Netflix, does this service that sort of can translate for you. You know, YouTube's full of authentic video that you can listen to and develop your listening skills. You know, if you really want to be good at speaking a language, you know, the, the, I, I, the most important thing is to get lots of listening practice. You know, listen as much as you can. You know, I, it's, I've met loads of people who are really good at speaking English who had really bad listening skills. And so, you know, it, for all their wonderful pronunciation and all their wonderful bit abilities, you know, they're often unable to engage in a conversation because they haven't developed the listening side of it. You know, if you develop your listening first, your speaking will develop itself. You know, yeah. it's all about being able to hear things and, and get involved. I don't know how relevant it is to your topic, but uh, someone is asking about how to teach learners to to differentiate between the real news and fake news. I think I'm guessing critical thinking and things from sources of information. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's about sources of information and checking your sources, verifying information. You know, if you do, I'm, having said Google was useless, I'm now suggesting do do a Google search, and you'll find quite a lot of of stuff about you know how how to sort of check news and to sort of check whether news is real and you know checking sources and validating sources interestingly i've seen a few questions coming through the chat about teaching pronunciation and um teaching uh to teaching pronunciation with a mask on and I don't think you necessarily have to teach with a mask on but you know I did a, a, a few years back when I was teaching with um, with uh, I was managing uh, the English up uh, teaching site um, which was involved with teaching training teachers to teach um, students through this environment I produced a whole bunch of videos for for how to how to um, how to teach pronunciation using the webcam. So I've just put a link to the to my YouTube channel there. And if you if you want to see a much younger Nick Peachy teaching pronunciation on the webcam, no mask involved, but you know we don't use one if we're we're on the webcam. You can sort of check those out and have a look and at some of the tips that I used. So do you think that it would be a good idea to record ourselves maybe on our iPhone, just modeling pronunciation and then bringing it to class? Um, yeah, that's a good idea, but we can use the webcam here. You can use things here. You know, I think I find one, I, of, the, one of the biggest problems or one of the biggest mistakes teachers made is make is being too close to the to the camera and too close to the screen. You know, most people are teaching from up here, you know, and you've lost all your body language and your hand gestures, you know, just getting a bit further away. I mean, I'm doing this standing up as you can probably see so I can move about, got my hands and could do all my, my things on the fingers just to get a bit further away from the camera, it gives you a much bigger space to work in. And that's, you know, that, that makes your teaching that much more effective, you know, just slide back a bit. Okay, it's a bit difficult. I have to go forward to get the, to the keyboard, but you know, getting that is, make is being too close to the, to the camera and too close to the screen. You know, most people are teaching from up here, you know, and you've lost all your body language and your hand gestures, you know, just getting a bit further away. I mean, I'm doing Sorry, something happened. Yeah, I think someone's probably listening to the, the YouTube feed, maybe. So it's coming back at you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I got muted anyway. I, I realized that the time is up. So, you know, I really ought to sort of, uh, I think somebody else has probably got a session now. So I ought to sort of get out of the way here. Nice talking to you all. Uh, thanks for coming. And, Thank you so um, much. And hopefully you got something from that and uh, it wasn't too kind of low level because I realize we have quite a few gurus in the audience, don't we? Uh, okay. Thanks.